This conference will now be recorded. Okay, everybody, welcome to the Cloud Communications Alliance uh, to um, our continuing series of webinars. Um, we started doing these webinars, you know, when COVID uh, kicked off, the COVID pandemic kicked off, and we've been doing them um, about every three weeks since then. Um, one of these days, we'll we'll kind of get back to meeting in person. And we're actually our board started talking about that yesterday, um, and hopefully we're getting close to that. Uh, but for today, first of all, uh, the buttons. You're all way too familiar with these buttons already. How to mute yourself, uh, how to turn your camera on and off. Uh, you can view the speaker, or you can view everybody. Uh, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to uh, text them uh, to the uh, chat them to everybody, and we'll make sure to get them out to the speakers. We have a kind of a two for today. Uh, we're doing um, uh, a two part webinar today. First, uh, starting with uh, an update on uh, COVID vaccine mandates. Um, one of the things I learned, and, and you'll hear from our speaker in a moment, Brian Weinthal, but one of the things that um, uh, I learned first time I talked to Brian was, you know, I thought these mandates only applied to companies of 100 or more, uh, large corporations, not necessarily the case. And kind of hear a little bit more about that in a minute from Brian. Um, and then the second half of our webinar today is going to have to do with 911 regulations and um, what's going on with the 911 world. And you have a, an obligation as a voice provider, uh, you have a very serious obligation uh, to provide 911 connection. And we'll kind of hear a little bit more about uh, 911 connection, how you can do it easily, how you can mitigate uh, some of those responsibilities. But first, uh, let me turn this over to uh, Brian Weinthal, who's our speaker, going to talk a little bit about the COVID mandates. Uh, Brian, take it away. Thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate it. Well, good morning. I'm in Chicago, but I do want to wish you a good day in whatever part of the world you happen to be in. Uh, I'm going to speak to you guys for just a little while about COVID vaccine mandates, where we are, where we're possibly going, and kind of what's happened, because, of course, the past two weeks have been a hotbed of activity for this subject. Before we jump in, let me give you some quick background on me. Uh, I'm a partner with a law firm here in Chicago called Burke Warren. I am formerly a lieutenant commander with the United States Navy's Judge Advocate General Corps. Uh, currently, I'm a management side labor and employment guy. I defend companies in various workplace claims. I do have experience before judges and juries at trial. And as Joe and I joke, I am a staunch devotee of Commander Kellstrom's theory of persuasive advocacy. Commander Kellstrom was the first judge I ever appeared in front of, military guy. And he used to say to me when I would drone on at length, Lieutenant Weinthal, the head can only absorb what the ass can endure. So I am going to be quick today and not use my full time, give you information, and then we can certainly follow up afterwards if folks have questions. So with that, Joe, let's jump right into our slides. Okay. Hey, Brian, before, before we do, I hope I'm not disclosing anything confidential, but, uh, but actually uh, Brian served in Guantanamo Bay uh, uh, as part of his uh, tour of duty on the JAG Corps. I, I find that very interesting, Brian. Unfortunately, now, Joe, several men will be arriving at your house within the hour uh, to speak with you. So you <laughs> cannot have disclosed that publicly on any type of open web channel. My apologies. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about vaccine mandates. So vaccine mandates in this country are really nothing new. They date back more than 116 years to an old, old case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Jacobson was a minister uh, at a time when smallpox was essentially destroying the United States. Massachusetts put a requirement in place of vaccination for those 21 and over, or as a penalty, a $5 fine. Jacobson took his case all the way to the US Supreme Court, and the court found that certain individual liberties could be subjected to restraints in times of great danger. Now, the Supreme Court noted that no one could actually be forced to take the vaccine itself, only, though, to suffer the consequences of refusing the inoculation. Now, basing your information on a 116-year-old case is not always the best decision because, of course, Jacobson was decided at a very different time in this country's history. There was no FDA back then. And, of course, they were dealing with a very different disease. Smallpox kills one out of every three individuals who get it. But the holding of Jacobson to this day is still valid. And it ultimately explains why the term vaccine mandate is something of a misnomer. Keep this in mind as we go through today. No one in this country can ever be forced to take a vaccine 
or to ultimately be subjected to any kind of medical care that they don't want. However, we can, as a society, condition certain benefits and privileges that you have access to, like employment, on your willingness to take those things. So understand that no one is getting hit with a vaccine against their will, but you can put conditions of receiving that vaccine for the other benefits that you have access to. Go ahead and advance this if you will, Joe. Let's for a second put the idea of vaccine mandates aside, completely on the shelf. Throughout the pandemic, our primary source of guidance on the employment side has been from the U.S. Department of Labor and the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Both of those agencies have been issuing continuous guidance throughout about what employers can do. Even before we had vaccines themselves, we know that certain things that these agencies arrived at were legal. For example, you can, whether we have vaccines or not, do mandatory workplace testing of your employees for COVID-19. You can also, as you can see here, make it a condition of entry onto the premises of your property to subject or have a negative COVID-19 test, also fully legal. If an individual or employee at your workplace gets sick with COVID-19, you can absolutely put a condition in place that they must show you a negative test to come back. And at the same time, you can offer just about any incentives you want, with the sky being the limit, to employees of yours to get vaccinated. All these things fully legal, and all of these were legal, by the way, even before we knew of or had access to vaccines. Joe, if you could take us to our next slide. Now that vaccines are widely available, there are additional rights and privileges available to employers as to what they can do. Employers can mandate vaccine as a condition of employment. Those who do that have to ensure that there are reasonable accommodations for those who raise either disability-based objections or religious objections, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Employers can also, without any problems, survey their employees to determine who is vaccinated and who isn't. This is not deemed to be a medical examination of any kind, but employers who do survey their, their employees and ask or find out who's vaccinated and who isn't can't take it to that next step yet to ask why not. So bear in mind that you can survey, but you can't ask the question as to why unless you take further steps. As we move to our next slide, the big question that I'm getting from my clients and from everybody that's involved in this crazy, crazy time we're living in is, am I required as a business owner or employer to do anything right now? The short answer is, no, and I caveat that by saying, at least for now. So on September 9th, the president announced that he was going to direct the Department of Labor to come up with new regulations on vaccination, and that those would apply to businesses with 100 or more employees. Now, this set the business world on fire as to what this would look like, what it would mean, where it would go, who would administrate it, and what would happen as a result of putting something like this in place. On November 4th, just a short while ago, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, which is a part of the Department of Labor, announced a new Emergency Temporary Standard, or ETS, for COVID-19 vaccination. Now, if you've been reading the news or uh, reading the papers, you know that the ETS, the Emergency Temporary Standard, was immediately stayed by one of the federal appellate courts, the one for the Fifth Circuit the one that has jurisdiction over Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And that literally happened within a day or two of that regulation being announced. Not surprising, quite frankly, we knew from the beginning that this would be subject to legal challenges, and we knew that people were waiting in the wings to file those legal challenges on the day or the day after the new ETS was announced. Unquestionable at this point in time that other federal circuit courts of appeal will become involved in this fight and will weigh in on the constitutionality of the ETS before anything is decided. It is almost certainly the case that this is a guaranteed US Supreme Court case. That said, 
I want to run you guys through what the ETS says, even if it may not be immediately binding on you, and give you information about where it goes and what happens under it, if in fact it was to survive the current series of legal challenges that it's subject to. The new ETS will apply to employers that have 100 or more employees. Those employers will be required, if this regulation stands, to mandate vaccination or to at least obtain weekly proof of a negative COVID-19 test for those employees that are not vaccinated. Let's understand what the 100 employee figure means. That's company-wide per corporate entity. To calculate it, it includes both full-time and part-time employees. Multiple locations don't matter. So what I mean by that is, if you have four offices of 25 full-time or part-time employees, you meet the standard for the 100 employee headcount. The only individuals who are not factored into that analysis are either temporary workers or independent contractors. They don't count towards your threshold. So if you can't get to 100 without those groups, the ETS will theoretically not apply to you. The mandate itself does not extend or apply to people that are working from home, to those that don't have any contact with other employees, or to those that work exclusively outdoors. So those groups will not be subsumed by the mandate. But under the ETS, employers have a number of steps that they need to take. First, without giving them any say in the matter, the ETS will require employers of 100 or more to determine the vaccination status of all employees. So while this was something you could permissively do before, if the ETS stands, it's something you'll be required to do if you have 100 or more employees. The acceptable proof of vaccination status under the ETS includes the items I've indicated there a record of immunization from a pharmacy, your COVID-19 vaccine card, or other medical records that will prove your vaccination. Under the ETS, employers have to provide paid time off to actually get the vaccine, up to four hours, and paid time off for recovery from vaccine side effects. What does that mean? Anyone's guess at this point in time. We have records of folks that have had no reaction to shots, and then I know people who have been down and out for a full two to three days as a result of their vaccinations and boosters. So what that means in terms of providing the paid time off, still not determined at this point in time. For those employees that are unvaccinated, the employer must also ensure that there is a nationwide, in other words, it doesn't matter where your office is, a nationwide mask mandate when indoors for those employees who are unvaccinated when they're around other employees. So at least for now, this would appear to trump or supersede the concept that individual states are dealing with their personal vaccine mask mandate, their personal mask mandates, pardon me, on a state-by-state -state basis. This overrides that. Joe, flip that slide for me if you would. So the big questions that, that come to the forefront here are, first of all, if the government is ordering me to do this, who is covering the paid time off that I have to provide employees? And at the same time, if I have to subject people to negative COVID-19 tests, who pays for those tests at a hundred and something, $20 a, a shot? Well, what the ETS says is that employers are not required to cover the costs of weekly negative COVID-19 testing for employees, but, 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 Many, many states, Illinois and California being the two most prominent, have statutes that require employers to cover the costs of any conditions of employment that are imposed upon employees. So very likely that states like Illinois and California and others that have requirements to pick up those costs are going to look to the employer to cover the cost of negative COVID-19 testing. Almost certainly the case that the employers who are saddled with those costs will have a subsequent claim of some kind against the federal government, because of course it's the government's rule that is making them shoulder those costs. But these are all issues that we're gonna to have to deal with in the future and questions that no one has the immediate answer to right now. 
The ETS notes also that employers may have to deal with picking up those costs under collective bargaining agreements. So those of you that have unions in place and at play are going to have to deal with those concerns as well. In terms of timing, OSHA's goal was to get those vaccine mandates in place by December 5th. There's no way that's going to happen at this point. Uh, the mandate has already been challenged. And frankly, starting from November 12th, this is going to be in limbo until we get a resolution on this on the legal side. As I've indicated, other cases will follow. So we're not going to see a resolution anytime soon. Under the ETS, theoretically, employers were going to be required to remove either the unvaccinated employees or those who couldn't produce a negative COVID-19 test by January 4th strong likelihood that that will not occur and that this plan is at least derailed for the time being. Signaling that that's the case, OSHA has suspended any enforcement efforts on this plan that could have resulted in fines of up to $14,000 per violation for employers. Again, all enforcement efforts tabled at the moment. Joe, would you flip us over? Now, just because the ETS has been sidelined, does not mean that you as employers cannot put mandatory vaccination plans in place for your employees. I want to guide those of you who want to do something like this through the process. If you choose to require a vaccination as a condition of employment, the first thing you need to do, much like would be the case under the ETS, is to conduct an initial confidential census of your employees to determine if you even need to put that mandate in place. In other words, figure out who's vaccinated and who isn't to see if you really need to put a plan in place. If you have 100% vaccination or 97% and the two people that aren't vaccinated are working from home, you may not need to put a plan like this into action. But if you do, you wanna make sure that you adopt a written workplace policy that announces that requirement and properly communicates it to your employees. You'll need to provide options at the same time for reasonable accommodations, specifically for those people who raise disability-based objections and religious-based objections, which we'll talk more about in just one second. You wanna make sure though, that if anybody makes a request for an accommodation, that those requests are kept confidential, need to know only, typically only amongst HR and other folks at the company who have a responsibility to protect confidential information, and you want to keep that information away from, separate, and apart from individual personnel files of your employees. Uh, I noted here that alternative testing for COVID-19 can be an effective means of limiting objections. What I mean by that is some people, some companies, are adopting the requirement that you need to be vaccinated or you don't work here, period, no option. A testing option, and specifically a negative testing option in lieu can be a way of ablating the amount of objection you get to anybody who is protesting these particular vaccine mandates when they're put into effect. Joe, if you would. Let's address very quickly the two common objections. Uh, I am ahead of schedule, so as promised, I'm gonna be done speaking early, which is my, my best gift I can give to any audience I'm in front of. Uh, let's go over the two common objections that are out there. First are the disability-based objections. These tend to be relatively easy to address because medical evidence is required in order to confirm. The simpler, most direct one we see most often is people who are going through some type of immunodeficiency situation that provides that they can't get the vaccine. The most common one is chemotherapy treatments for cancer patients. Most times doctors will recommend that if somebody's going through a chemo regimen, additional immunocompromising injections like a vaccine is uh, would not be safe or effective for them at that point. Medical evidence, as I said, is required to sustain these, but most people who raise these types of disability-based requests for accommodation come forward with the medical evidence in advance. To the extent that you receive something suspect that does not look as it should, understand that you are not obligated as an employer to accept medical evidence that's provided by an individual. You can absolutely request what's called an IME, which is an independent medical examiner's opinion to confirm that the objection someone is making ultimately is both correct and legally defensible. Be aware when it comes to a requested accommodation of working from home. 
So here's what's so interesting. At the front end of the pandemic, if someone raised the objection that they couldn't work from home, and if an employer had ordered everyone back to work in those first few months, that was a good defense by the employer. In other words, well, you want to continue working from home, but now that we're slightly into this pandemic, we're all coming back. We're going to make this thing work. It's going to happen. The problem is many companies have not had people at work for a good two year period here. So understand that if you suddenly announce you're bringing everybody back to work, that that's the reason you need the vaccine mandate. And someone says, well, I like the accommodation of continuing to work from home. That might be a little harder to defend if your company has effectively been working from home for the past two years. So the defense of bringing everybody back and that's why we should all vaccinated that's why we should all get vaccinated, does not have the power or defensiveness that it would have at the front end of the pandemic. Just keep that in mind as you deal with these issues. Let's keep going. Religion. Boy, is this one a tough one to, to assess. The question surrounding religious accommodations is whether the belief system is sincerely held. Now, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has weighed on this several times. And it's important to understand that they put some pretty crazy rules in place. For example, just because the leader of a religion expresses a certain opinion does not mean that that's binding or conclusive for somebody who is requesting an accommodation on a religious basis for a corresponding opposite reason. I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. The primary objection we're seeing is a common internet myth of disinformation that says that there are fetal cells in the COVID-19 vaccines. Cloned fetal cells were used for testing purposes, for testing the efficacy of the vaccines. But what most disinformation campaigns have wound us up to believe is that there are fetal cells in the vaccines themselves. That's not true. But the argument that gets made is taking those vaccines is analogous to abortion. Employers will need to assess whether that religious belief when it's asserted by employees is sincere. Remember that it is permissible to ask questions and engage with your employees with regard to whether or not their beliefs are sincerely held. Let me give you some, some ammo in dealing with these issues. First, all 50 states, every one of them have vaccine requirements for children uh, in the educational context, MMR, chicken pox, hepatitis, et cetera. All of those vaccines were tested on the same clone fetal cell lines that have been grown over the past 50 years. And also, common over-the-counter drugs, Tylenol, Pepto-Bismol, and Exlax are also tested using those things. So frankly, the argument is if an individual either has children who have attended school and were vaccinated, or has used any of those common over-the-counter medications, does not have the analogous argument that the same testing that was done for the COVID-19 vaccine can sustain as a religious objection for purposes of taking those vaccines. Very importantly, uh, to the extent that anybody was not aware, the Pope is vaccinated. He himself has called vaccines a blessing, and the vaccine has deemed vaccination consistent with Catholic religious dogma. So realistically, there tends to be very few outlets there uh, for employees to make arguments that they can object on that basis. Where are we on mandatory vaccination under United States law? Well, we're in chaos right now is the, is the honest answer, okay? But nevertheless, despite the ETS legal fight that's going on, mandatory vaccination is clearly emerging as the legal winner. I'm sure that many of you have read about the various vaccine objections that have been made by organizations, the New York Teachers Union, Boston Medical, the LA school system, all have lost thus far. So even if the ETS does not stand or is struck down on legal challenges, it is clear that employers likely will have the power to mandate vaccines and ultimately will be successful if they choose to do so. States, individual states are continuing to set their own agendas. Nine states have banned mask mandates, for example, and 20 have banned vaccine passports. Texas is now saying that COVID-19 is an available basis. Having had it once already is an available basis to object. But in all likelihood, the federal law will trump those even if the ETS challenges are successful. Let me give you the best advice I can possibly give you during this pandemic, okay? Don't be at the tip of the spear. Watch what other companies are doing. Follow their lead. 
don't be the company that breaks out of a mold and either takes an extreme position on one side or the other on something you're going to do during the pandemic that nobody else is doing or no one has done before. Watch, wait, and see what's successful or not successful by others, and then make your company decision on that basis. Very smart move. And of course, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you want a hand to hold yours to walk through this kind of process, ask your friendly employment lawyer, as I am, for advice. This is all I do all day long. I suspect this is all I'm going to continue to do for quite some time at this point. So please reach out. I'm available. Joe's got my contact info. I'm sure he'll give you a copy of this PowerPoint or make it available to you. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or concerns. Uh, I have a couple minutes left, so I can take a question. Or Joe, we can save them to the end, whatever you whatever you prefer. Um, well, let, let, I'll tell you what, we, we do have a couple minutes. Uh, any uh, questions? Anybody wants to turn on their camera and just uh, ask a question or just verbally? Anybody? All right, Evan, hey, I think you, hi. Yeah. So on slide nine, you said working from home um, doesn't count towards the vaccine mandate. Does it still count towards the hundred? Yes. Employees? Okay. Yes. It, let's let's put it this way. I mean, yes, right now under the ETS, guaranteed to be yet another legal challenge made to it that the those working from home should not, but for the moment it does. Okay. Thanks. Hey Brian, it sounds like I mean that this is a hard one to answer, but it sounds like this is going to be tied up in the courts for quite a long time. This isn't going to happen in probably first quarter of next year, I would guess. I think you're 100% correct on that. So frankly, like it's like it's always been, it's on private industry to largely figure out how they want to handle this on their own. I don't see any significant support coming from the survival of ETS. And frankly, you know, if we're if we're if we're being candid and frank here. The ETS has a lot of problems. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm one of the strongest proponents of vaccination and workplace safety. Um, but that said, the ETS has a lot of open-ended questions that employers will successfully be able to challenge, at least the ones that are that are objecting to it. Um, so I see a lot of concern, and I think you're right. I don't I don't suspect by the first quarter we'll have this figured out. Thanks, so Jeffrey. It's on you guys in private private industry to act. Um, but again, you have the legal authority to do this kind of thing on your own. Without the benefit of ETS, is kind of a kind of a takeaway. Great. Anybody else? Okay, and we are going to make these um, this presentation available to everybody. So we'll uh, we'll email that that out to you after uh, later on today. So uh, Brian, if they need to contact you, you know they'll have your contact information. Feel free to do it. Um, uh, Brian, thank you. Great My great pleasure. presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, next up, uh, we have Mark Lindsay. Um, Mark, I'm going to turn this uh, presentation over to you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Brian. I will share now. Great. It looks like it's coming through. So uh, thank you very much again, uh, Joe and Karen, for organizing. Uh, I'm going to talk about the new 911 compliance. Uh, there's been a lot of fast moving regulatory changes here. Um, and we'll walk through some of these things and some of the new uh, requirements and kind of implementation challenges that VoIP and UC providers are facing and thinking about right now. So um, I haven't had a chance to uh, speak to you guys in particular, so I'll just introduce our company a little bit. Uh, so ECG is an engineering uh, firm. We uh, provide expertise supplementing your knowledge and skills, so your internal engineering and your, your business management team. Um, our goal is to complete projects much faster than uh, we, you would typically be able to do internally. Um, our goal is to give um, high quality, unfailingly reliable software development and engineering uh, services. So that's a, our, we have really high quality standards for how we build out these systems. And then, um, and this is a key thing I wanted to point out is we're unbiased in, in the sense that we don't have any formal vendor relationships where uh, we're not uh, a value-added reseller in general, where we're um, providing advice to a particular vendor or not. So we're representing you to help you work with your vendors and your um, your engineering partners to accomplish projects. So some of our clients are listed here. As you can see, we've got a good bit of public sector um, <laughs> service providers, et cetera. So I am um, a senior member of technical staff here. I've been with the company since 2003. ECG is 20 years old now. We've been doing VoIP engineering the whole time. Um, one of the recent projects I got a, a, a chance to work on was the uh, NINA, the National Emergency Number Association, um, 911 the distributed denial of service project. Uh, I'm one of the contributing authors there, and I've been doing network engineering and software development since the 90s. So 
a kind of a legal disclaimer here. This is for informational purposes only. So we're an engineering consulting company. We do software development and project management, but we're not a law firm. So uh, we are advised by some of our friends here at the CCA, Marash Lohan and Donahue. Um, and so if you have questions about legal applicability of these things, you should see a qualified attorney who can look at your state and, and federal regulations um, to find out what applies. I'm also going to um, talk about some of the requirements that are in place that have future implementation requirement dates. So the FCC has a number of these requirements that they've uh, put on UC and VoIP providers that are not, uh, that those dates haven't come yet. So you're not, you're not behind the game on some of these items I'm gonna talk about if you haven't done them yet because uh, these are future dates. But as engineers and business managers, I'm sure you're thinking about how to build out your network to, to meet those standards as they come along. So uh, first question we'll talk about, it's interesting, uh, what devices and apps what must support 911 calling? So uh, if anything can make a call to a telephone number, it needs to be able to call 911 and provide its location. So we have sort of our usual suspects over here on the right, you know, an analog terminal adapter, a VoIP phone, um, these are obvious candidates. They've, we've had to provide 911 calling on these devices basically since the early 2000s. Uh, but then there are some others we'll just touch on mobile apps. These are something that we don't always think about as being the same, uh, the same category. Gadgets that support outdialing numbers, contact center apps where your, your call center agent is able to place an outbound call, uh, then that call center application uh, needs to consider 911 calling uh, within that application because of the broad nature of interconnected VoIP and the, and the new requirements for this 911 calling. So I'll give some examples here. Um, Microsoft is one of my clients. Uh, Microsoft Teams is required uh, to support this. Uh, if you have uh, Microsoft Teams integrated into your service provider network, then you need to ensure that 911 calling works across every device that's able to call a telephone number. Um, I've got WebEx here, just we'll bring in Cisco. So the WebEx calling, uh, one of the things that people don't think about is these uh, these WebEx boards uh, where you can do whiteboarding on it. These devices have the ability to place outbound calls to telephone numbers. And as such, this device, um, as I understand the regulations, is required to be able to support calling to 911 as well. That's a new challenge uh, that we have to deal with. And obviously apps, mobile apps, including uh, apps on your mobile device that, you know, maybe that call doesn't even route through your network um, all the time. I mentioned contact centers uh, applications as one of the uh, one of the areas here that you need to consider. Many of them are going to have the ability to place outbound calls. Um, if they have the ability, that ability, then you need to consider the 911 there. And then uh, I've got an example. This is the Fresh Desk app here on the right. This app is mostly meant for customer service, but it does have the ability to place outbound calls as well. You also want to think about vertical market apps if you're building an app to support plumbers or housekeeping at high-rise hotels then those apps, if they have the ability to place outbound calls to telephone numbers, then they need to be able to call 911 as well and provide their location to the PSAP, uh, to the 911 call taker uh, when, that is, when that is answered. So this is pretty broad. Uh, it gets even weirder. Uh, the applications, uh, the rules actually put requirements on these kinds of devices. Like I've got a picture of the a Google Home device and an Amazon Dot, Echo Dot. Uh, they have now the ability to place outbound calls to uh, PSDN numbers. Uh, other home devices don't have that ability, and so there's a there's some uh, differences in the market here. But these devices, where they add the ability to place outbound calls to um, to PSTN numbers, they they suddenly pick up the requirement that they uh, need to be able to place calls to 911 as well under the interconnected VoIP rules. So, uh, and it, they don't have to be able to receive inbound calls. It's okay if it's a one-way outbound only device. As long as they can place an outbound call, they have to be able to place an outbound uh, 911 call. Okay, so next question. Uh, one of the new things that's come up, a big new term is dispatchable location. And we'll talk about that. But a key question here is managing cost and kind of the new scenario here. So let me talk about the old approach. And I've got a warning here. This is not the recommended way of doing it anymore. And we'll talk about why. So here we've got a business with a couple of rooms, room 101, 102. They're in 100 Main Street, Adel, Georgia. There's a public safety answering point. And you is their VoIP service provider, UC provider. You're the one that provided these phones in this location. You've got Alice's phone and Charlie's phone here. You put one entry in the Alley database. So this is one 911 uh, telephone number. You're going to pay a monthly fee for this typically to load this and maintain this in the database. You might use vendors like Bandwidth or Entrato to do that. You populate one entry there, you give it one civil street address, and in the old days, things were golden. Uh, if Alice made a call to Bob, 
Then uh, the calling party number for Alice was Alice's DID, you know, ending in 1001. But if Alice makes a call to 911, then the 911 telephone number can be used to place that outbound call. So the 911 call taker receives the calling party number 229-896-1000, which matches the entry in the Alley database. And the call taker and the first responders get access to this civil street address, the, the 100 Main Street. Uh, similarly, um, Charlie call, Charles calls Doug. Uh, Charles has their own DID, same story. But when Charles calls outbound, Charles uses the same calling party number in this legacy scenario that I cannot recommend anymore. And the, uh, the 911 PSAP system would take it, would do that same lookup. So in this scenario, we would have one physical street address and we only have one entry in the alley database. And the reason for doing this one entry is simply to manage costs best because these entries in the alley database are an additional cost per month. Um, in, in addition to the regular uh, telephone number origination uh, costs of having these the IDs route inbound to uh, Alice and Charlie, uh, we want to minimize that cost. And so many UC and VoIP providers minimize the number of Alley database entries that they have to uh, enter simply because they wanted to, um, to manage costs but be able to provide 911 compliance with, a, with the old regulations. This is not recommended anymore. Let me, let's talk about why. So the key rule is that if a uh, device or app can call 911, the 911 call taker at the public safety answering point must know where that device is at the time of the call. So you'll hear me talk about users and subscribers and devices. The FCC regulations really focus on devices because the device basically becomes the marker for the location of the user where the first responder should go. So if I pick this, my iPhone up and I place a call to 911, and I'm unable to speak, well, they're gonna send an ambulance to the best location of their of the device. That's what they're trying to do. And so the, a lot of the regulations are very device centric because of that. Uh, and of course, every call is being placed from some kind of device, whether it's a wall board that I can write on or an echo dot, uh, there's always a device involved. So a couple of key concepts here, we have to provide dispatchable location. And this really boils down to the room within a building where the device is located. And that information about what room they're in, which includes, uh, in, include, includes, of course, their suite, their floor that they're on, the building within a campus environment, the civil street address that the, the room is located in. All of that goes along with this concept of the room where that user is, that caller is located. That has to be provided automatically to the PSAP. And that's what we didn't see when we had calls in our, the previous example I showed. We didn't have the room that these people are located in. Uh, and um, there are some good technical options available today for basic enterprise facilities and networks. And we'll talk about where, you know, where those are. Uh, the real time uh, piece of this is the new, one of the new wrinkles. We have to uh, provide the location at the time of the call. And, it's, and this is particularly true and becomes a particular point for devices that are easy to move. So if a user can pick up their phone and move it, uh, this real time location sensing is kind of one of the new challenges we have to work through. Service providers have to be able to detect when the uh, device that can call 911 has moved. And in particular, you just have to be sure that you provide the device location at the time of the call. That's the, that's the key thing. Uh, you may choose to collect the information before the emergency point, but you just need to be able to provide the location at that point in time. So legacy registered locations, you know, up until basically this year, uh, we could register a location for a particular telephone number. You could store that in the Alley database. You pay the fee monthly, and you want to minimize the number of entries that you've got there. So that was that's what I showed you on the previous example. But now you can take that approach and kind of tweak it, and you can say, well, we don't really want to change our whole whole technology stack for determining location. We're just going to start adding new Alley entries per room. Um, and so in this case, we'd have Alice and Charlie before. We have two entries in the Alley database now before they start making calls. We've got one for room 101 and you've got another for room 102. And as you might guess, when Alice makes an outbound call, um, Alice's uh, caller ID shows uh, her DID, but then also when she calls 911, we just reuse the DID for that purpose and we give their location. And so in this case, when the call comes into the PSAP, the call taker can determine that Alice is in room 101, which is where Alice's phone is at the time, because of that status of that information in the Alley database. Uh, next, uh, we see Charlie. Charlie makes the call, same thing, except this time, of course, Charlie's 911 call has Charlie's DID on it, and we use that to identify the location of room 102. So this, you might find is okay. This will meet the standard because we know where the device is uh, at the time of making the call. 
we're able to provide the room information for that. And of course, if you had additional details, suite, floor, building, that kind of thing, you would also populate that those details in here. So this is acceptable. And I'm gonna say in rough terms, this is okay as long as these devices don't move around a lot. So as long as it doesn't fit in your pocket, this is probably a workable plan as long as you've got human processes to determine when these devices move. Now that's actually part of the wrinkle. Uh, we have to be able to detect under the rules, we have to detect when these devices move. And I've and I've worked with the team at uh, Comlaw Group about this. That I've said this is really challenging because there aren't very many technology vendors available in the market that actually help us to detect when these devices are moving. And we're not seeing a lot of rapid movement by some of the big vendors, uh, Microsoft and Cisco in particular, who who provide a lot of the cloud calling platforms. Um, are there? I don't see a lot of motion in in their feature set related to this. So this is a challenge. It is solvable. There, are, there is some technology out there that'll do this and I expect it to get better. But let me talk about what we've got to do. So here we've got Charlie's phone and Charlie's phone is in room 102 and they're going to move it into the lobby. Now we, what we have to do is pick up that change. We have to detect that that phone has changed to another room in the same facility. And then we have to update the Alley database so that when um, Charlie makes a call from the new phone's location that the 911 call taker will see that the phone is now in the lobby and not in room 102. Um, so the takeaway here is that service providers must detect when the endpoint moves from its registered location and then update to ensure that the Alley database is up to date. And that is a, a new wrinkle that we have to deal with. What I'm expecting is kind of our next generation is that uh, the 911 caller, uh, caller's location is going to be sent with each call. So registered location, which is this Alley database where we populate an entry, it's the kind of the, I'm going to call it the old fashioned way that we've been doing it for 10 or 15 years. Um, it's okay to do as long as the locations are mostly fixed, um, but the link between the calling telephone number and the location is weakening. Uh, and there are some options out there that kind of make this a little bit better. What if you've got multiple phones in the same room? Do you really want to uh, put in an entry for each phone in the same, uh, each phone number if you've got multiple entries in the Alley database and you're having to pay for several entries when you really only need one entry per room? Uh, at the facility. Uh, you may have a big room with 100 phones in it, you know, cub cubicles, for example, it's ideal to provide cubicles, but as long as the first responders can locate the calling party, um, you may not have to provide the cubicle number. So there are some options here. I'll give you an, a good example of what Clearly IP is doing. Um, I don't believe they're CCA members, but they actually allow in the SIP signaling a way to basically mark that location. So in effect, what you're doing is when you send in a 911 call on a Clearly IP SIP trunk, you provide a tag and they use that to identify the appropriate emergency location. And so that allows you to minimize entries in the Alley database. You could have uh, basically, a, uh, you know, a thousand DIDs and you may have 50 different rooms. And so you have 50 different location IDs and you send those through as your emergency calling profile ID when you send the call through. That that uh, you might choose, depending on your structure, you might choose to find a vendor like that, a SIP trunking vendor that gives you an option like that. Or if you're a SIP trunking provider, you may choose to implement a technology that lets you do this for your customers. Uh, so for example, when you give them a quote to be fully uh, carries law and Ray Bombs Act compliant, you don't have to give them a quote, including you know, pricing for each and every room in their building having a separate 911 database, because that may cost you out of the deal. So finding alternate ways to be able to provide lower cost uh, option implementation options here can be pretty important when you go to uh, offer service, especially on SIP trunking. Uh, the registered location really is not a perfect fit when we're talking about mobile VoIP app. So if I run the WebEx calling app on my iPhone, you know, this phone is always moving. And if I'm on an interstate highway, I'm still required to signal through, as a service provider, I'm still required to signal through the location of that device, even if there's no actual street address involved. I'm in a, you know, a particular mile, between two mile markers on a highway. Really registered location is not a fit there anymore. So some VoIP 911 providers, for example, bandwidth.com and Trotto support sending the latitude and longitude in the SIP invite for 911. So you can send the, the lat long and elevation through, and that allows you to signal the location just right there in that moment. And I think that's kind of where things are gonna be headed. And I'll, I'll circle back to that in a minute. So one of the other questions that, uh, that comes up in this space is what about the robocalling uh, scenario here? Uh, the, what about call blocking and the fact that you know, the FCC is really encouraging uh, call blocking? Uh, as of this year, voice providers are now expected to work to stop illegal calls. You're not allowed to be a voice service provider and just can, can blithely allow your customers to place outbound calls in violation of 
um, the you know FTC rules or the um, Consumer Privacy Consumer Calling Privacy Act. Um, you know you have to ensure that the calls that are routing through your network uh, are legitimate. In effect, um, that puts some new burdens on there. We're not going to talk about those burdens directly today. That's a that's a whole complex uh, kettle of fish. But one of the related factors here is that uh, we stop illegal calls. We also want to stop calls that are contributing to a denial of service attack or that are contributing to some kind of malfunction. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of reports of voice-based denial of service attacks being used to overload 911 call centers. And earlier this year, in February, the FCC, actually, I'm sorry, the FBI actually released a, a warning about this saying that they're seeing a lot of cases where folks are using um, using VoIP providers to overload 911 uh, contact centers, PSAPs. Um, and we did an ECG, got to do some work on that. We have a, a recorded webinar you can watch on that that topic. But one of the takeaways from that is you should never block a call to 911, even if you think that it's part of a de denial of service attack. You have to work with the, uh, the FCC and the 911 operators, the PSAP, in order to determine what kind of mitigations are necessary if your network is being used um, to do that. Uh, but a corollary, a related element here is you should never block a call back from 911. And this is a case where you have a call that comes into your network that doesn't look like a call to or from 911. It's going to come from a telephone number, uh, probably owned by your local government uh, of the where the PSAP is, and it's going to route back to the calling party number who placed recently placed a 911 call. So this is the scenario. You, you pick up your phone, you dial 911, you hang up immediately. The NINA processes say that what they're supposed to do is call you, attempt to call you back. And if they can't call you back, they're going to try to send some sort of first responder to come visit the location where the call was placed from. Um, so you have to be really careful about blocking these potential for calls coming back. And so as you're implementing, uh, you're implementing call blocking to attempt to block spam calls, reaching your customers, nuisance calls, things like that. That's all good, but you want to have in mind that you don't want to block these callbacks. So an example of how one technology vendor is handling this, this is not, again, not a company we uh, have a special relationship with at all, but I'm just aware that Mutari has a feature uh, in their spam calling uh, platform where they can detect that 911 calls have been placed or one call has been placed and then they, um, they change their behavior so that they uh, specifically want to permit inbound calls uh, as 911 callbacks, just to ensure that those callbacks are not blocked. Um, so that's a factor you want to be aware of as we're kind of mingling these new regulations. And these things really on spam call blocking, robocalling, and the 911, these regulations have moved really, really fast uh, in just the past few years. So building the future, how do we go from here? You know, if you're like most VoIP service providers, you've got the ability to support registered locations, and you're probably in many of your customer scenarios, you've got one registered location per civil address, per street address. That's pretty normal. Uh, I think the real, the long-term um, uh, story here about location is going to be that you're sending the the real-time location. So when a call comes through, we're actually going to probably on a normal basis, we're going to send through the location, latitude, longitude, and elevation along with that call. Well, you and I both know if you work on this technology that, you know, your Polycom phones, your Yellink phones, uh, a lot of other phone, great phones out there do not send latitude, longitude, and, and elevation today. They don't have GPS capabilities. And so there's kind of a gap here in how we do this. Uh, you, it, the gap may be filled through different technologies like enterprise SPCs. It may be that the uh, the call doesn't you know pick up the location quite in the way that's depicted here, but obviously some of your equipment in the middle is part of sensing that location. But my my sense is that uh, sending through the lat long elevation is going to be kind of the technology future here uh, because it works really really well for mobile devices. And there are ways that we can get there and accommodate kind of a single way to do this for everyone. And it, what it does is it removes our requirement of uh, adding entries to the Alley database in the way that we were doing before. Uh, it allows us to um, build technologies that allow us to detect the movement of devices, relocation of devices to new rooms, detect those, and then uh, send through appropriate uh, location sensing. I'm expecting vendors, though, like Poly, like Yealink, like so many others, uh, to actually get involved in this and actually assist with some of that location sensing. It may not come quite in the form of latitude, longitude. It may be things like CDP or LLDP med port locations because these devices, they have, uh, in many cases, they know what port on the ethernet switch they're plugged into. They can actually detect whenever they've been moved to another uh, location. And so some of that enabling technology could be used. Um, so engineering the transition, how do, we, how do we get there? Some big picture steps to, that I'm gonna recommend you work towards. One is 
thinking about your apps, which can uh, determine which can support 911 um, uh, calling because they support PSTN numbers. If you can call to a PSTN number, you've got to be able to call 911. Um, determine which of your devices can be moved to another room. Those are the those are the cases where you need to be able to detect if the devices get relocated. Determine uh, what kind of tech solutions you're going to need. You know, it's very likely that in the next five years, the way that you handle device location sensing for a desk phone is going to be different from the way you do it for a, an app running on an iPad, and that might be different from what you do on an Android device. <clears throat> Similarly, SIM trucking is going to require some different uh, some different technology. After you've looked through those things, you're going to want to evaluate and test these different solutions, adding them to your network. Uh, so that you can actually implement and roll this stuff out so that you can uh, achieve compliance with the new rules. A few prominent vendors I'll make you aware of here. Uh, obviously, uh, Bandwidth and Entrato have, are big players in terms of receiving and processing those calls. Entrato owns a company called 911 Enable that actually makes some technology that is important. They, they're really focused on uh, connectivity to local uh, police and first responders. And so uh, that's 911 Enable also has some technology related to detecting location of the calls. And then Red Sky Networks is another organization. They're really focused on enterprise and campus locations, detecting the locations of the calling party. So Red Sky is seeing a lot of uptake and integrations that, we're, that are going on right now. Uh, I think though the market is young and I think for organizations that have internal software development uh, capabilities, then uh, you're, you've got a lot of potential here for looking at different ways to do this. If you're a, if you're a CCA member and you have a, an app that you directly develop, you have access to the code, and you control it, then you may want to start thinking about how do I go get the, uh, the location information out of the iPhone and the Android devices, and then how do I get that to my 911 providers? Um, so those are some of the upcoming engineering challenges. I'm just going to touch briefly for time. I'm not going to go through this completely, but there are six key 911 rules. Uh, I promised a, a summary of these, uh, and we're going to email this out to you. So um, if, if you join this webinar, you register, we'll, we'll email out the summary. But there are six rules. Um, 911 is required for anything that can call a PST number. You've got to have simple dialing. I didn't talk, touch on Kerry's law very much today, but you've just got to be able to call 911 directly. You can't have any uh, special other codes. You need to be able to provide dispatchable location. That's a new requirement. We need to be able to uh, update the location. The end user has to be able to update lo their location at will. So if they've got a desk phone, they need to be able to move their desk phone. And I think generally the sense of that, they're updating their location at will means if they move their phone at 10 p.m., they probably need to be able to make that change at 10 p.m. Um, uh, we need to be able to detect when the device moves from its registered location. And, and as I read the rules, that means that from one room to the next room. Uh, and then we need to be able to provide central notifications. Another Ray Baum's Act carries law requirement so that if your user has multiple phones, if your customer has multiple phones, you really need to be able to notify a central location. And this, these requirements are exceptionally broad and they really cover most VoIP providers um, and UC providers. So this is us, I'll, we'll, we'll make this available. Uh, Trevor Wolford, my colleague is on uh, and he'll be sending out the, uh, the little PDF with kind of the summary of those rules that you can use as a checklist. But I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe. Great, thank you. Uh, hang on a second, my webcam back on again. Mark, Mark thank you too. Um, we have just a couple more minutes. Uh, we actually five minutes. Uh, any questions uh, for Mark on the 911 presentation? Mark, that was great. Uh, very, I, I know I rushed you 30 minutes. Uh, I appreciate the rush, but uh, questions anybody on the 911? Can I jump in with a quick one? Please. Um, hey Mark, nice to see you. Um, I just want to confirm the detectable relocation piece that you just talked about. I, from your presentation, it sounds like that's a future desire. It's not something that really is implementable today, given the lack of functionality in the phones, etc., and apps. Is that true? As to the deadlines on those, I want to say that deadline for uh, devices that are in fixed locations may be January next year, so not very far off. Um, it actually is possible. There are some of the vendors in particular, what I'm seeing the most uh, uptake with is Red Sky. Um, the, uh, I would say you want to work with your attorney if you want to ask for a, a flexibility or additional time on, uh, on that kind of thing. That Detecting that a device has moved to a new location, just like you, you pointed out, is a big deal. Um, but uh, one of the things that I've been advised from the Comlaw group was, well, you need to be able to, you would generally make a case that the technology is not available. 
Uh, I would I would encourage you, you got to look at Red Sky. Again, we're not resellers or anything, but you got to look at Red Sky and see if what they have is uh, a potential option um, The um, for uh, for uh, doing that, um, for providing what you need there. The, the service provider uh, has to be able to detect this relocation um, of the of the device pretty soon. Hey, uh, Kevin Brown, I, I see you texted a question. Maybe you want to go ahead and ask it just, uh, verbally if, if you're with us. There you go. Yeah, I, I was basically saying, um, you know, if you have a campus environment and you have um, a business process or, the, or the, the campus has a business process that's in place that says, you know, their IT or their telecom group or whatever has to be involved in the move of any, any device. Do you still need to detect that that device was moved? Um, basically, you know, guaranteeing that an unauthorized move uh, didn't take place. I the um, the rules that I can point to it's it's in 47 CFR. I want to say 9.11, uh, uh, but I can go back to this. So I, I'm going to defer the detailed questions to the attorneys. But my memory of it is that business processes don't um uh, don't give you necessarily an exception for that so you wouldn't want to necessarily depend on those however when it came down to it um you might have if you had a complaint by a customer and they had agreed to follow a particular process then you might have something like a defense uh but that's that's well outside my expertise the the, the straightforward rules say if the device has moved from a, its registered location, you must be able to detect that and then prompt the update. You have to go fetch the new location, which might mean contacting the user or something like that. Uh, but it, it's written about, um, it's, it's written about the, um, uh, in, ensuring that that update actually does occur. Thanks, uh, thanks Mark. Anybody else? Hey Mark, uh, this is Jose. I had a quick question. So as a VoIP service provider, what do we need to do to be compliant by the January 6th, 2022 deadline? I just want to make sure I'm clear. So the specific deadlines, um, I am going to, uh, I could give you a summary, but I'm actually going to defer that. But here's the thing. Some of it, there are some requirements on multi-line telephone systems and interconnected VoIP. Some of the requirements, if you meet the requirements for both, then you actually need to comply with the interconnected VoIP requirements related to location sensing. What I have done, and this summary has kind of given you a, um, an engineering overview, this is the read, this is what it seems like a lot of UC and VoIP providers are going to have to do kind of in broad terms. Some of these deadlines related to especially the relocation of mobile devices, such as, you know, apps that are running on iPhones, those dates are definitely off in the future. Um, the specific dates for um, compliance, um, I am, I, I'm sort of making my business to uh, set those aside so I, I i'm not the right one to answer your question jose really um there okay. is some there's some good stuff i know michael Pryor mentioned that there's some information on e911 compliance obligations and deadlines on the cca website so i would check there the fcc does have some good information and they interestingly and kind of uh, frustratingly for me they really make a big distinction on requirements for multi-line telephone systems and for interconnected voip the challenge is most of what we provide in the uc space where you're selling service to two users may or may not be at the same location, but it's kind of PBX-like, um, right. appears to qualify as MLTS. And so um, and so those that adds additional, uh, some of these additional requirements, but. Yeah. Um, my, my Mike Pryor is with us today. Mike, are you uh, still here? Um, if you are, maybe you caught a chime in on these deadlines. I think we might've lost Mike. Yeah, I just I think we did. with that whole relocation piece, it's going to be really difficult. Yeah, hi. Um, hey, hey, Joe, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Mike. Uh, Mark. Mike, yes. Yeah, hey, um, yeah, so just very quickly on, on the compliance deadlines, and again, as I said, there, there's a fair amount of stuff on the website, CCA for this, but uh, come January, um, for multi-line telephone systems, you know, most enterprises, um, you do have to uh, provide the sort of dispatchable location information. Um, now there is a, a, a kind of an out if it's not technically feasible, um, but the general requirement is that when you send uh, information along with the 911 call, you should try to provide some more granular information on where the call came from. If you, you know, if you're in a multi 
uh, story building. You might want to try to give a floor or a quadrant, something like that, more than just the general street address. Um, so that requirement is coming up. Um, and, and, you know, I think as has been noted, there are some technical solutions out there for this. Um, but yeah, that, that, that requirement is coming up uh, soon. Well, well, thank you, all. Um, Mark, Brian. Thank you guys very much for today. Uh, really informative. Um, our next webinar is going to be December 7th. We're going to talk about the uh, future role of the channel in Europe. Um, we might kind of morph that into a bit of a uh, CCA holiday party as well. So we'll, stay tuned. We'll kind of communicate that with everybody. And then in January 12th, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, regulatory landscape in 2022 in Europe. Uh, more on that coming up. But thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate your membership at Cloud Communications Alliance. And thank you. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.